It's First John chapter three, verse one. Let's have a look at what it says. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer and commit this time to him. Father in heaven, we thank you once again for your love, for your blessings, for your grace. And we pray for more grace now as we seek to learn from your word. And Father, I pray that uh, you would hide me behind your cross and that you would uh, use me as an instrument in your hand simply to convey your message uh, to your children. We thank you once again for your love. We thank you that you are who you are and we have much to rejoice in in you. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We had uh, uh, a wonderful uh, men's leadership uh, meeting yesterday. Um, they were designed originally to, uh, to help remind us as men how important it is for us to be leaders in our homes, in our families, in the church and in this world. And um, it's difficult to be a leader <clears throat> these days. There are too many uh, obstacles and oppositions and problems in the world. And, um, and we had a good turnout, but I wish we had more, to be honest with you. It's, it's a wonderful time of fellowship that we can encourage each other uh, uh, through. But also, we need to remind ourselves constantly. It's a reason why we have church every week. God knows that uh, our, our memories are short. God knows that we're easily distracted. And so we need to constantly be reminding ourselves and edifying one another uh, to walk in faith in this world. And it is a battle every day. Uh, we battle with our own flesh. We battle with the, the, the lures of the world, uh, the devil. So um, I want to encourage all men uh, to, if you can, to join us in that. You're all welcome to join. There is no specific requirement for you to, to, um, to partake in that or to be part of that. Uh, if, you, if you want to join, you're more than welcome to join. And I, I pray you will be blessed through it as I know you will bless us by being there. Um, but we had a, a great uh, meeting yesterday. We went through the first uh, chapter of Titus, uh, which reveals the important need in all churches for godly leaders. And it also revealed the godly relationship that existed between Paul and Titus. And, and Paul calls Titus his own dear son in the faith. And so there's a sort of father-son relationship in a spiritual sort of uh, way um, where Paul sees himself as a fatherly figure to Titus. <clears throat> and the world is, is in need of godly fathers and men of faith. And as it continues to lurch further and further away from God's design and counsel towards the world's uh, view or views which keep on morphing and changing over time, the, the world is finding itself in a greater and greater moral fog. It, it's finding it harder and harder to see uh, ahead. And so the world's walking into a spiritual blindness as it walks away from and, and, and this, this, um, this connects itself to the foundations of the Word of God, especially in the Western uh, society. But what the world lacks in holiness and um, moral objectivity, which is what we find in the Word of God, <clears throat> um, we have in perfect abundance from our Heavenly Father. We have perfect objectivity in Him because He is objective truth. He is the truth. He is the definition of those things which are related to everything moral and everything good. And we find in him security. We find in him peace. And we find in our Heavenly Father um, love. In him we have a Father who loves us perfectly. He knows us perfectly. 
He cares for us perfectly and he provides for us perfectly. Our earthly fathers may have tried to do all those things, but being a father myself, I realize I fall short in many of those. But in him, we have our perfect example and our inspiration. What we lack as fathers and men, what our own fathers lacked in raising us, we find in our perfect heavenly father who revealed himself perfectly through his only begotten son. And so today, my, my sermon is designed or in the hope of achieving three things. To honour our Heavenly Father, first and foremost. To honour our earthly fathers and remember them and to pray for them and to, and to encourage them in their uh, desire to do what's right. And to inspire us as earthly fathers and men to be more like our Heavenly Father. If I achieve those three things today, I'll be more than happy. Let's, let's uh, look at our, uh, our text for today. 1 John 3, 1 says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. You know, one of the things I often heard as I was growing up in, a, in an Italian family in, uh, in Avondale Heights in Melbourne, um, when we considered people from other nationalities that we weren't too familiar with and, cul and, and cultures that we, we saw things in that we didn't quite understand, uh, we'd say stuff like, I'd hear my grandparents say stuff like, oh, we're all children of God. And they would say that in sort of a dialect. We're all children of God. Okay. So, and this was used most often in circumstances where, where, um, someone else had done something which which would be considered slightly strange or different um, to what we're used to or maybe even against what we would probably uh, understand so so for Italians who are mostly mo who are mostly Catholic in their religion <clears throat> they considered they still considered other people as God's children simply because they're born into this world and, and the the idea was that they were born in God's image you know, one of the surprising things that I learned when I first began to read the Bible for myself was that this was not the case, which was an eye opener to me. According to the Bible, everyone is not a child of God. You're not born a child of God. In fact, you're, you're, you're born a child, but then you're not a child because you, you have a fallen nature. In fact, the Bible says that the vast majority of people in the world are not the children of God. But they are by nature his actual enemies. And for me, that was a, a, an eye opener. Because if, if everyone wasn't a child of God, well, then what does that mean in terms of their relationship with him? What does that mean in terms of, <clears throat> in terms of you know, getting to heaven? And thus the dilemma. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. For a moment and I'd like you to read with me uh, verses 1 to 3 so Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 to 3 and the word quickened here is uh, is um, is important the word quickened <clears throat> which we don't tend to use often these days means to be made alive okay so being brought to life and so Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says and you and it's speaking about us as believers hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins where in time past he walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation which means our life in times past in the lust of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. And so that passage alone clearly describes that at one stage we weren't saved. And if we're saved today, we weren't before. And that is always in that order. The picture here is of a rebellious and sinful people worldwide, which we are part of and were part of, who are dead in sins. And the difference is that since we were saved, we've been made alive by the power of God. 
But notice in verse 3, it says, Among whom also we all had our conversation. All of us. So there isn't one saved person today who was not a sinner and dead in sin before. We were all, all got to that stage. We were all sinful at one time in our lives. We start off that way. In fact, we are, the Bible says we are born with a fallen nature. And that fallen nature may take some time to sort of come out and manifest itself in sin in a person's life. So at, a, at an early sort of age. Um, but you can count on this for every person in the world. That once they get, they get to a certain age and they understand right and wrong, the fallen nature manifests itself. Thus, that fallen nature condemns us before the moral laws which govern the universe. And so every person becomes guilty before God. It's a bit like having a virus which has a 100% kill rate. Okay, It kills 100% of people that it infects. And it kills them within a few short years, essentially. That's what the fallen nature actually does. And it is a, a like a genetic mutation, like a, a virus that is able to be passed down from parent to child, from parent to child, all the way down the line, so that we all inherit this same fallen nature from our very first parents. And because we're born with this thing, it eventually kills us. Now, a child may not understand what sin is, but as soon as they do, the fallen nature manifests itself. It begins, they begin to have this thing within them where they have a conscience, but they also have the fallen nature, which inevitably drives them to sin and away from God. And while our, our conscience may be screaming at us to go the other way, our nature inevitably will find a way around it and around those alarm bells that ring within us. But those alarm bells that have rung within us eventually become the pointing finger that condemn us as well. So everyone's in a bad situation, everyone, regardless of what culture you're born in, what time you were born in, what parents you had, what, what, what situation you find yourself in, everyone. Is, uh, is in a difficult situation because, once again, this particular virus has a 100% kill rate. But there's a but coming up, and it's super important in this passage because it leads us to an amazing discovery that changed us internally and, and it changed our destiny as well when we received it. So verse 4 says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. What level of mercy is this? Well, the Apostle Paul calls it rich. What sort of love is this? He calls it great. Why? Because he chose to love us when we were rebellious and sinful and hateful towards him. We were slaves of the devil. We ran after our own flesh. We wanted to be glorified. We want to be God ourselves. That is the problem that we have with ourselves. In other words, our, our original parents fell for the line that they could be gods themselves if they just had that fruit. And when their eyes were opened, they realized something was wrong. But we still have that innate desire in us for us to be God, for us to govern ourselves, to, to bow the knee to no one else except ourselves or to a God of our own making, which we fashion in our own likeness. Um, there was a, 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 an author, um, was it Dickens? I'm not sure. I think it was a, uh, an American author who wrote, God created us in his image and then we returned the favour. In other words, we then created him in our image. And that's exactly what happened when we fell. We continue to create gods in our own image. 
And so we see the plethora of gods out there. And what we see in them are gods that were created in our image. They are not like God. They are more like us. And we fashion gods and people fashion gods to their own liking that fit themselves. But in this particular case, even though the world are as filled with idolaters and, and, and lawbreakers and people who are rebellious against God, God chose to love us even in that state. We did not go looking for God. The Bible makes that very clear that there is none righteous, no, not one. None of us sought after God. The Bible says that he came seeking after us. In fact, the whole story of God the Father sending his son into this world is a rescue mission. Is a story about a rescue mission of love where God has come into the darkness in this world and we have this light that glows in this darkness and that was in his son. And so God came searching for us. We didn't go searching for him. And because he was rich in mercy, he came to redeem us. And because of his great love, he gave that which was the most precious to him to show us how much he loved us. And through that, he gave us life, which we did not deserve. And that's why he says, by grace are you saved through faith. Do you deserve it now? No. Do I deserve it now? No, we still don't deserve it. That's why God continues to give us grace every day. The manna fell on the, um, the Israelites when they were in a desert, remember? And it fell every day for them. And they, they only collected what they needed for that day. And that's a bit like God's grace for us today. We need it every day. And we can't store up grace in big bags and keep it for a week. We literally need, because we are in a, living in a parched and dry world uh, with not much righteousness and not much holiness around us. Um, and we need God's grace every day to get through. And so I want to remind us all of that. But turn with me to John chapter 1, verse 12, because he puts it in a, a lovely way. Um, John chapter 1, verse 12, this whole love that God has for us and how he rescued us, um, even when we were his enemies. John chapter 1, verse 12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, it wasn't our will that, that wanted us to go to God. It wasn't, it wasn't our, uh, the will of the flesh. It wasn't the will of man. We had to be born spiritually. We can't inherit this thing from our parents if they're saved. But the picture here is that as many as receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Saviour have then the power to become the sons of God. Not before. Before that, we are not God's children. And so if you think of this life we now have for the moment. Or you think of this new life that we've been given, that we've been that that He would make us alive together with Christ, His Son. He makes us together. He makes us alive together through his son. And it's a wonderful thought when you think of it. Um, we have now a union with God that we didn't have before. And I know that each of us miss each other and we miss being together. But there's something interesting I want you to understand. Even though we miss each other on a physical level and we want to be together, which is a natural thing that we, that we have that's, that's, that's built into us because now we have a special love for one another that he's planted in there. The Bible says that um, somehow we are already with him. So turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6 just for a moment. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. Just go back there because... I want to have a little bit more of a look at this particular passage. Just that one more verse. We've read already that 
you know, but God who was rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us, which means made us alive together with Christ. Now that just keep just focus on that word together for a moment. Together is a wonderful thought. I wish we were together now. We long to be together with him. Um, but in one way we already are with Christ. We are already together with him. And how you ask? Well, have a look at what it says in verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You get that? He didn't say here, and Paul's speaking about himself. When Paul wrote this letter, he wasn't in heaven. He hadn't passed away. He was on the earth and he was still living with other believers. He says here that God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Spiritually, you and I are already sitting together with our Savior in heaven. Somehow we are already sitting there, not working, not doing anything, just sitting there with him in heaven yes spiritually and in our new nature we are already home there is nothing that can happen to us here on this earth that can take that seat away from you or i if you are saved today you are already home we are already home with our savior and with our father and that is amazing love that is something that when we look at our own lives here on this earth and, the, and the, the deficiencies that we have, the problems that we have in our own lives, the weaknesses that we experience and we get frustrated with, the fact that we are already sitting with Christ in heaven, for me, shows an amazing love. And this is the, the amazing love that God has for us. That he sent his son into this world to give his own life for us so that we can sit with him. Now, I mean, would you give your life to someone who hates you? you, know, would, you would you offer your life and allow yourself to die for someone who hates you, who has, wants nothing to do with you, who slanders you? Is it normal, that type of love? Of course it's not. But God's love is not normal in this world. It's not the type of love that we experience regularly. Oh yeah, you might experience love of a parent, which is, which is deep. Love of a friend. The, the Bible speaks of various types of love that, are, that, are, that, we, that we have. Yes, an unsaved parent can love their child. And the children can love their parents. And friends can love one another. But the type of love that God speaks about where... Someone who is so undeserving receives that love when they didn't even ask for it. There's something that this world struggles to understand, especially when you think of the perfect nature of God. He is the one who, who, who's offended. He is the one who should be offended at all of our sin and hatred and, and all the things that, we, that this world gets up to. Yet, he bypasses that offense and comes and saves us. We did not deserve that love. We didn't earn that love. We can't work to keep that love. In Romans chapter 5 verse 6 it says, For when we were yet without strength. If you want to turn with me, Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8. It says, For when we, we were yet without strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. That's pretty rare for, a, for someone to die for someone who's really good. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, which means not righteous, not holy, not godly, but enemies, Christ died for us. We didn't deserve it, we didn't earn it, and we can't work to keep it. But we can rest in that love. 
We can sit with him. We can acknowledge what he's done for us and be at peace because we don't have to work to get to heaven. We don't have to live in a state of ignorance. We don't have to live in a state of unknowing or a state where we're not sure about what our eternal destiny will be. But when you know what your eternal destiny is and that you were already at home with him and that there is a seat ready for you there at the table with him and somehow we are already there and, he, and he's enjoying our company, you can enjoy his company even today. And you can rest in that love. You can rest in his unchanging love. Yeah, your love and my love can go up and down like a yo-yo sometimes. Our faithfulness seems to sometimes be um, uh, fleeting. You know, there are some days you feel like you're the, you know, the, the, the greatest saint that's ever lived and then there are other days you feel so miserable. Um, yet God is consistent. And, it's, and that seat that we have, that rest that we have, does not rely on us. Because if it relied on us, we'd be in and out like a yo-yo. We would we'd be up and down. We'd be in, and ev in heaven, out of heaven, in heaven, out of heaven. Because it only takes one sin to, to go to hell. It's God's love that is consistent. Such a consistent love that we struggle sometimes to understand it. And this is what the story of John 3.16 is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That word is everlasting. God did not give us temporary life, that at the next point we fail, we lose it. It's everlasting. He's given that to us now. It's not something that starts when we die or when we're raptured. And because we experience that his love now, we now have a wonderful opportunity to love him in return. And we can truly love each other and the people of this world because we're at rest. We're at peace. We have our eternal destiny secure. There's no fear in death for us anymore. But love casts out fear. When you are loved perfectly, there is no need to fear. And when you have, I remember... Now, whenever I'd, I'd walk down a, a dark street with my, my dad, with my father, I had no fear. My father was there, my, my earthly father was there with me. Didn't have to fear if anyone, you know, uh, wanted to cause trouble or anything when I was growing up. When I was with my dad, I didn't have any fear. But that is true for us today as believers, that our father is with us every day. There is no need to fear. There is no place that he is not. There is no place we can find ourselves that he doesn't carry us through. Even in death, he's there. So there is no need to fear when you have God. There's no need to fear when you've been saved by his son. There is no need to fear because he is consistent and he never, ever fails. But let me ask you an important question, which you should ask, answer for yourself. Do you think God the Father loves you any less today than when he chose to love you as a sinner? Do you think God the Father loves you any less today than when he first saved you? You know, if you've hesitated to answer that question, then there's something wrong with your thinking. Because his love doesn't change. His love does not depend upon your success or failure. His love is consistent. His love for you has never changed. If he loved you when you were a sinner and his enemy, do you think his love is less for you today? In fact, it would be ludicrous to imagine that he loves you less today after he has made you his own child, after he has brought you home, after he has sealed you with his Holy Spirit, after he has cleansed you by the blood of his own son, to think that he loves you less, or somehow his, his, his love is not as much as it was before, is foolishness. God is love. That's his nature. 
And it, his nature does not depend on your success as a child. God is love. And to, to deny him that is your flesh wanting to prove itself worthy. It's your flesh while rising out to say, but I can prove myself here. There is nothing to prove here. There is nothing to gain. His righteousness has been given to you. His, his blood has cleansed you of every sin and stain. His relationship with you was already perfect. If there's anything that the devil will try to get you to do is to focus on you. Because the moment we begin to focus on ourselves and how wonderful we are and how not wonderful we are and what we do and what we don't do is the moment we begin, the flesh begins to rise up and say, but I've got something to prove here. I can do it. I can show him that I can do it. Is the moment we open up ourselves to failure. Because if I rest in him, and this is the story of the gospel, if I appreciate and have a thankful heart and I understand his love for me I naturally will not sin I will naturally not go away from him I will naturally trust in him every single day it's what the gospel is about he has changed us from the inside not from the outside by law our Heavenly Father loves us perfectly. And because of that love, he continues to care for us perfectly. We are in his hand. He is not in our hand. I can't let go of him. He's got me in his hand. If you've sinned, then let his undying love drive you closer and closer to him. Not away. Do you remember the problem with Adam and Eve? The first time they sinned and their nature had then fallen, what did they do when they sinned? They ran away from God. They hid from him. That is not what God wants you to do. If there is any sin in your life, if there is anything that, that you have that is coming between you and God, he doesn't want you to, to run from him. He doesn't want that sin to, to be the cause of you running from him. He wants that sin to be the cause of you running to him. To come to him. To rest in his love, to experience his forgiveness, to live a life of victory is that is that very definition. If you have sinned, if you have a problem in your life, if you don't see yourself as the child that you would like to be for him, then let his love change you. Let his love drive you closer and closer to him, not the stick, not the whip. Stand in awe of his love for you each and every day. Stand amazed at the unmerited grace that he continues to give you and me through Jesus Christ every single day. Rest in the perfect refuge and shield that he is for you. Look to him as a perfect example for when you, you're dealing with others around you. And that is something that we often fail in. How well do we imitate him? when it comes to dealing with others, especially others that we don't agree with. How well do we love others who treat us badly? How, how well do we, do we deal and love others who, who slander us or who might conspire against us, who, who don't understand us, who are threatened by us? How well do we love them? How much grace do we have for people who hate us? When God had so much grace for us and still has grace for us when we fail so miserably. Do we really love others? Has he loved us? Christians, beware of gossip. Beware of sharing information that may not be true about anyone. If you pass things from one to the other and it's not true, let me remind you, that is called gossip, regardless of who you're talking about. Beware of judging others, especially when you may be doing the same thing. Beware of slander, which means trying to cut someone down with information that once again may not be true. Beware of malice, 
Beware of envy. Beware of pride. Can Christians be proud? Oh, yeah, you sh- I'm sure they can be proud. We can be so proud about being independent, fundamentalist Baptists who believe in the word of God and no one's like us. It's wonderful, isn't it? But if it makes us proud, it's not wonderful at all. Because we're only here by the grace of God. If we hate anyone, the Bible says, we've missed the point. None of these things are from God, but they are from the flesh. God doesn't call us to hate our enemies. I haven't heard anywhere in the Bible where it says to hate those who hate us. In fact, it calls for us to love them the exact opposite. With what type of love? With his love. With the love that we received and we didn't deserve it. You might say, well, they don't deserve it. Well, exactly right. That's the whole point. They don't and neither did we. And there's nothing better in us today than, than, than before other than what he has put there himself. Let our own imperfections, let our own humbleness before God and obvious weaknesses that we have appreciate God's love more and more. And then let that inspire us to love other imperfect people, hateful people, like God loves us. We're not called to pass judgment upon others. That's God's business. We are called to love. Not even those who call themselves our enemies. You know, God will judge righteously. That we can be sure of. So trust in his judgment. Leave that with him. And he can. Because he's already shown them that he has perfect love. So in the end, if they reject that love, and they've rejected his provision to, to be saved, they will have no excuse and the Lord will judge them. But we have been called to imitate our perfect father. He is our perfect example. So not, okay, so we've, we've looked at how wonderful God's love is for us and how he perfectly cares for us and how he showed us that love and continues to show us that love. But he is also our wonderful and perfect model. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Matthew 5, verse 43. And this is something we should aspire to. This is something we should take seriously. This is not something we should just, you know, read and say, oh, how wonderful that is, and then put it to the side. We have been called to this. To fall short of this is a shame for us. We should be so different to the people of this world that they should marvel at what they see in us. Yet we don't tend to see it. Matthew 5.43 says, You have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? That you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. But those words sink in deep into our hearts. Is there a brother or sister that you have animosity towards, that you haven't forgiven? Remember how much you have been forgiven. Is there someone in this world that you hate? There should be no room for that in in our lives. If they hate us, let us love them. Let us pray for them. Let's bless them and do good to them. Those are the things that will change them and draw them to God's love. But if they don't see God's love in us, where are they going to see it? God the Father... He's our perfect example. And this is what his children should look like in this world. That's why we're here. That's why he hasn't taken us home. He hasn't taken us home to be with him just yet because he wants them to see him through us. He wants them to see him in us. 
Do we show that? Do we honour him in that way? I hope we do. I pray that it's more and more each day because these days are short and the days may be running out. Our Saviour may be here today or tomorrow and we should live life like that as if today is our last day. What would you do with it if today was your last day? How well would you use it? Would you use it for his glory or for your own? Would you spend more time on Netflix or spend more time running around chasing things of this world? Let's be inspired by him every day. And if you're wondering those people that may be conspiring against us, maybe people in leadership or maybe people who have some hidden agenda that we don't quite exactly know, well, praise God, pray for them as well. Bless them as well. Because those are the people that are included in this passage too. And even if they blaspheme our Heavenly Father, you might say, well, don't we have a right to be offended if they blaspheme God? Offended at what? Offended, are we supposed to be offended when they, when they sin against God? They sin every day. And if they blaspheme God and, and they say things that are, that are opposite to us, our Father is the omnipotent ruler of the universe, the perfectly righteous one, the unbeatable one, the all-knowing one. To be offended at people who don't follow God is like being offended at a dog barking at a bulldozer. How dare that dog bark at that bulldozer? Why would, you, why would you be offended? Of course not. It's like an ant threatening an elephant and berating the ant. Does the elephant concerned about the ant? Is the ant any threat to the elephant? Is, is, the, is the dog any threat to a bulldozer? Of course not. They no threat to God. They, it's not as if they're hurting his ego. But our egos get hurt. That's the problem that we face. We're the ones who get offended. We're the ones who are hurt. We're the ones who are scared. We're the ones who get threatened by other people. And it should not be the case. Because if you're sitting with Jesus already, if you're at home with him already, what threatens you or I? There is nothing in this world that can threaten you or I. There is nothing that we need to fear because our Heavenly Father walks with us every step of the way. Why would we fear? We should have no fear at all. God has, has given us a perfect example of how we should live in this world, how he gave it in his own son. He revealed his perfect nature and character through his son who lived the perfect life. He is the lamb who gave his life for the entire world. And we're called to be lambs in this world. In fact, he said, he goes, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. He didn't send us out to be wolves among lambs. He didn't send us out to be lions. He is the lion who will return one day. We're called to be lambs, to be perfectly innocent, to not be threatening. We're called to be meek. We're called to be patient, kind, merciful, gentle, gracious. In other words, we are called to love as he loved us and he gave us an example. The world will not naturally understand your eye. That is a given. It never has. Didn't understand Jesus, didn't understand his apostles, didn't understand all of his disciples, it killed, it killed pretty much all of them didn't understand through the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, didn't understand through the Enlightenment period, didn't understand ever. The world we live in is pretty much the same as it always has been. The world will not naturally understand you and it will all, always see you as a threat. It's natural. Don't be surprised. Don't be alarmed. Don't be frightened and don't live in fear because your Heavenly Father is always with you. Just follow the example he set in his Son. And so 1 John 3, 1 finishes with the words, therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. 
the world doesn't recognize us anymore. We're not the same. You know, growing up in the western suburbs of Melbourne, a bit of a multicultural area, I went to St. Bernard's, and that was a bit of a multicultural school. It was easy to spot though, even from a young age, where certain people were from. You could pick them up pretty quickly. You know, apart from their looks, okay, you had, you know, fairer skinned and darker skinned and, you know, darker hair or whatever else it may be. You'd pick up their accents and the type of clothes they wore and the cars they drove and the foods they ate. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm smiling because I'm just uh, getting a mental image of some of the people that I grew up with. As a teenage, teenager, it was, it was pretty, it was super easy to spot other children with Italian backgrounds, right? You know, you'd spot easily the, the people that you, um, that come from the same background as you because they were the ones at school that had the prosciutto and salami sangras in their, in their lunch boxes, which you could smell when they opened them up. They were the ones who normally had darker sort of hair and not light, and they had olive skin. They had surnames that ended in vowels all the time. And that's not to mention, you know, most of them were Carlton supporters. That was normally a dead giveaway. In addition to all these things, you know, we often, you know, they're often subtle cultural things which gave them away you know maybe their accent there was a bit of an accent or their choice of words might have given them away maybe their sense of humor gave them away i don't know from from my background we have this this thing about we we're hanging on each other as we used to say i'm not sure if they still use that phrase where you'd make fun of yourselves and your own family and friends before you make fun of anyone else for sure and you always found humor in in the silly things that we did and the choices that we made um, but, and Italians always seem to have a distinct knowledge of not just who their, their immediate family was, but their cousins. <laughs> and with Italians, it was, you knew who your second cousins were, your third cousins were. And so you had, you know, you naturally had weddings of 300 people or more, which is, was, wasn't normally the case for English, you know, uh, background uh, people. You know, each culture or background has their own distinctive traits, you know, things that they've inherited from their, you know, from their parents and grandparents, or, or things that genetics have, you know, have, have passed down to them, or things they've learned from their culture, which makes them distinct from other cultures. And that's natural. That's the world. You know, plenty of good things in cultures. There are some bad things in cultures too. Um, but what we need to understand is that what's also natural is that once a person gets saved, they have a new culture. There's a new genetic line there. You'd have a different family. And so you begin to look more like your heavenly father. You begin to look like and act like, make choices like him. You begin to behave more like a citizen of heaven than a citizen of earth. And so the words you use, the mannerisms, what you're focused on, you know, what you're comfortable with, what you're not comfortable with, becomes different to the previous life that you had. And this is because your identity has changed. Your home is no longer here. It's in heaven. You now have God as a father. And he is an influence in you through his Holy Spirit. I turn me to John chapter 14 for a moment, at verse 6. It reminds me of when Philip uh, asked Jesus to show them God the Father. And I, I love this, this particular passage. And it just reveals so much uh, about Jesus and about, about uh, his disciples. They'd missed the boat on so many things over and over again. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, You know, Jesus saith unto him, now he's about to speak the most, <clears throat> the most, uh, the deepest, the most uh, uh, important words that we almost have in the Bible. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, they, they are some significant words just there. If you just just focus on those for a while 
Jesus is unique among every person in the history of mankind. There was no other person in history who even came close to saying anything like that, that they are the way, the only way, the truth, the definition of truth, that life comes from them and that they are the only way to God. Uh, Jesus is truly unique. Anyway, so verse 6 says, Jesus made this statement. And verse 7 then says, If you had known me, you should have known my father also. And from henceforth, you know him and have seen him. So Jesus is essentially saying he is God in the flesh. When you see him, you are seeing the father. And so Philip pipes up and says, this, Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the father and it sufficeth us. Lord, just show us the father and that'll be enough for us. Then we'll believe you. Then we'll understand what you're talking about. Philip, you've missed the point, mate. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? Now, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. You know, I can almost see the expression on Jesus' face. You know, I've been with you for so long. Haven't you recognized the Father in me? Have I been with you so long that you still don't get it, Philip? When you see me, you see the Father because he's working through me. He is in me. Jesus is exactly the same essence as the Father. Jesus is saying, I'm the splitting image. I'm the splitting image of the Father. And you're saying, show us the Father. Jesus was the perfect image of his father. When you see Jesus, you see the father. They are so perfectly in tune. They are so, Jesus is such a perfect representation of him that when you see him, you're seeing God. They have one mind. They are indistinguishable. They are of the same essence. Now, let me ask you today. We've been adopted and transformed. And given the spirit within our hearts. We've been made the children of God. We've been given his very nature. So let me ask you this morning. As we celebrate Father's Day. How much are you like your heavenly father? How much do you look like him? How much do you speak like him? Act like him? How much is he showing through you? How much of him do people see? In you in the world today do they see his mannerisms do they hear his speech his language are they getting the accent are they seeing his love of course the world's going to see us as strange that's inevitable of course they'll feel threatened people always do when they don't understand or when they're given some objective truth that they're told to they have to either accept or reject but if they don't see anything different in us today, then the problem may be with us. If they don't see him in us today, if they're not inspired by him, if, they, if, that, if what's different in us is not coming through to the point that they are either attacking us, hating us, or being drawn to us, there's something wrong with us. And it may mean that we are trying to blend more into this world we are trying to fit in more to this world, which means we're trying to honour this world more than we're trying to honour God, our Father. Remember always, you may look at yourself and say, oh, no, but I don't feel sometimes like a, you know, a child of God. I don't feel that way. I don't feel like I'm sitting with Jesus already. I don't feel, you know, feelings have nothing to do with it because our feelings are often mixed with our flesh. The flesh uses our emotions against us. It uses our feelings against us. It uses pain. It uses uh, uh, environments and circumstances. It tries to conspire against our own flesh, our fallen nature. We'll always try to get the other upper hand to draw us away from God. But 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Now. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. 
but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Think about that verse for a moment. We are God's children now. Not in the future. We are, you are his child. If you have received Jesus in your heart, if you have received him as your Lord and Savior, if you've accepted the sacrifice he's made on your behalf today, then you are his child. We know the Father now. We are called to behave as his children now. We may not look like his children on the outside, our glorified state at the moment, and we don't even know exactly what this is going to be like, right? We can't probably even imagine what it's going to be like the day we are transformed to look like him. But we do know that that day that Jesus, our Savior, appears to take us home, that we will not only see him finally in his glorified state, but we will be transformed to be like him. You know, I sometimes picture ourselves as, you ever seen these car restoration shows uh, on, on TV at the moment? Um, they take like an old car that's been sitting in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a back of a barn somewhere and maybe full of rust and dirt and everything and the paint's faded and someone looks at that and they realise it's a model that, you know, that, that they love and you know, maybe they, they, they really admire the way, the way it was made originally or maybe it's got a particular brand they like and they take it and they look at it and they say, I want to buy this. And so they buy that car and then they, they go through all the work of transforming this car and then it comes out of the showroom, it comes out of their, their, uh, their thing, looking completely different to, to, to what it was when they first bought it. I feel like we are like that sometimes. We are like a car at the moment that you know, was rusty and, and, and dead and decaying you know, and someone has bought us for a huge, huge price because it's, it, it valued us so much. And they knew in their mind's eye exactly what they wanted this car to look like. And they, and they bought it with the view of restoring it and making it even greater and more valuable and beautiful than when it first came off the production line. And so at the moment, it's being worked on by the best mechanic and, and designer that the world has ever known or the world has ever seen. And, and you know, it's being designed and being molded and being, and the rust is being taken off. And, and this thing is you know, currently hidden. It's hidden in a, in a, in a, in a, a, a work room somewhere and it's, 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 the world hasn't seen it quite yet. But wait till that car comes out of that, out of that uh, work room. Wait till the world looks at it and goes, wow. That's what he was working on. That's you and me. And while we're being worked on by God, and the world doesn't quite see us, we know beyond any shadow of a doubt that we aren't, we haven't been left to rust and to decay away into oblivion. No, we owned already. Despite the sufferings and trials and tribulations that we may go through, you know, sometimes that rust has to be taken away. Sometimes it's painful to see those sparks flying, to be, to be molded, to be changed, the one that loves us and has paid such an enormous price for us will never, ever abandon us. So remember what you have in your heavenly Father. Remember there is great joy we have to look forward to. Remember there is nothing in this world that can snatch you out of his hand. There is no one who can cause you to be lost ever again. And this meantime, this yearning that we have to see our Saviour and to be made complete, let that drive you. And this is the, the Spirit working within us. Let the Spirit speak to you. Listen to Him. Don't listen to the loud voices that are in this world that are all trying to get our attention away from God. 
Let the Spirit speak to you now. Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 17, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit, the spirit of bondage again unto fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Dad. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified with him. Yeah, we can cry, Abba, Father. We can call him Dad. We, can, we know that he is always looking out for us. He is our dad. If you're saved, he's yours. You own him as much as he owns you. If Jesus is your savior, yeah, you belong to him, but he belongs to you. He is yours. He is a possession that you will never ever lose. And if we are his children, then we are joint heirs with Christ. Imagine that for a moment, joint heirs, which means all that he has to inherit from God, his father, we inherit along with him. I can't imagine it. I can't imagine that day, but I'm looking forward to it. And that's why 1 John 3, 3 says, And every man that had this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. This hope keeps us focused. This hope keeps us pure. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Remember who you have as your father. Act like him. Speak like him. Be transformed through his word each and every day of your life. Rely on him for all things. Don't rely on your own strength. And continue to have ultimate confidence in his promises to us. Um, remember, what you believe about God will ultimately determine how you live for him. If you don't if you doubt God's love for you, then your love for him will not be pure. If you doubt that he has grace for you, then you will be fearful about your next step. If you doubt his commitment to you, then how can you be committed to him? If you are saved this morning, then you already possess a perfect heavenly father, a father who will never forsake you, never abandon you, never fail you. A father who is perfect in every possible way. He is always trustworthy. He is always full of grace, mercy and love. Now that's a father. That's a father that we can rejoice in and honour today and every day of our lives. Let's do that as we seek to honour our earthly fathers and to encourage them to be more and more like him. God bless you. I pray that this message was a blessing to you. Looking forward to seeing you all again um, very soon. Let's continue to pray in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of, of the decisions that our governments are making and our leaders are making. Um, let's pray for wisdom for them. Let's bless them. Let's pray for their salvation. And let's pray that God opens that door for us because I'd love to be with you all together again. God bless you all and happy Father's Day to all those fathers out there. Looking forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you.